Howdy folks! Today we'll be talking about classifying arrhythmias and heart block. Let's take a look at our agenda for the day. First, we'll be talking about normal conduction in the heart. Then, we'll be talking about classifying arrhythmias. And we'll end the discussion by talking about heart block. Now, I just want to point out, there are already a lot of videos on YouTube going through specific arrhythmias. Therefore, I'm going to focus the discussion today not on going through every arrhythmia, but providing you with the framework to classify them and understand them very broadly speaking. For specific details on specific arrhythmias, I suggest you look for them on YouTube. There are lots of videos, plus in your textbooks. So to start, let's talk about normal conduction in the heart. Here, our great artist and videographer, Peter Shea, has drawn a heart with the conduction system in blue. Normally, all electrical impulses in the heart We'll start at the SA node, indicated here by this blue circle, also known as the sinoatrial node. From there, the impulse will spread through these tracts to the AV node, or the atrioventricular node. It's also important to note that the SA node will send uh, impulses directly to atrial muscle here, as well as sending the impulses to the atrioventricular node. Now this node is very important because it slows down the conduction. This is important because the ventricles need to contract after the atria. The idea is that the atria will help push some blood into the ventricles, and then the ventricles contract to push it into the pulmonary and systemic circulations. So this AV node conduction slowdown is crucial to normal cardiac physiology. From here, the impulse will travel from the AV node to the bundle of His. At this point, it will split into the RBB, the right bundle branch, and the LBB, or the left bundle branch. As the names might suggest, they supply the left and the right sides of the heart with electrical impulses. So these will travel down the bundle branches, and then eventually they'll reach little small fibers called Purkinje fibers, which are located in the subendocardial space of the heart. And these will directly transmit the electrical impulse to the ventricular myocytes, which will then cause them to depolarize and then contract. So just to recapitulate, SA node to AV node to bundle of His to the right and left bundle branches to Purkinje fibers, to ventricular myocyte. That's the order of normal conduction. Now, as I had mentioned, the SA node is where most um, of the impulses start in a normal person, right? This is the natural pacemaker, so to speak. But let's say the SA node stops working for whatever reason, right? When that happens, the heart doesn't immediately shut down. There are other parts of the heart that can take on the job of pacemaking. These are known as latent pacemakers. And on the left here, I drawn a table of all the pacemakers of the heart and their uh, rates of firing. These rates correspond to how many impulses they'll fire per minute. And the number of impulses will translate to the number of heartbeats per minute. So this is the SA node, right? The natural pacemaker, which sets off 60 to 100 impulses per minute. And then all of these are the latent pacemakers. So if the SA node fails, the atrial node will kick in. If the atrial node fails, the AV node will kick in, etc., etc. Now what's really important about this is the order. The fastest one will take over. So if the SA node stops working, it's not like the ventricular muscle will immediately take over necessarily, right? It's a pecking order. The fastest thing will sort of, sort of suppress the others and become the main honcho in controlling the heart's electrical activity. Also, important to note, these numbers are not exact. Uh, different sources give you different numbers. This is just an overall sense of what they might be. And the overall idea that the SA node is the fastest and the ventricular muscle is the slowest. So for whatever reason, the ventricular muscle gets completely blocked off from all this other stuff. It can still fire, but it's going to fire at a very slow rate. And this is important to understand, because in, uh, in heart block, when you're separated from these top things, you get a, your impulse generated from these bottom things here, and that leads to bradycardia, because these have slower intrinsic rates. So that's a really important concept to understand. The intrinsic rate gets a lot slower as you go down this pecking order. So now that we discussed normal conduction in the heart, let's talk about uh, abnormal conduction in the heart, arrhythmias. So there's two overall schemes to classifying arrhythmias. We can classify arrhythmias by the location of the arrhythmia, the location where the impulse is generated, or we can classify arrhythmias by the mechanism by which the arrhythmia is generated. And right now we're going to discuss both systems of classification. So with regards to location, normal uh, heart rhythms are generated by the sinus node. But when it's not, we can call it an arrhythmia. There's two general categories for classifying these abnormal locations. We could call it supraventricular, which literally means above the ventricle, 
or we can call them ventricular or originating at the ventricular myocytes themselves. Now, there's important EKG findings associated with each of these types. In both supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, there's a lack of a normal P wave. So recall that in a normal ECG, that sinus, right, originating at the SA node, we find a normal P wave, followed by a QRS complex and a T wave. In both these kinds of arrhythmias, we don't see normal, a normal P wave. It could be a lack of a P wave, and sometimes it could be a bunch of little bumps. You know, there's variation. These aren't 100%, but generally speaking, lack of normal P wave is associated with these arrhythmias. Now, one important distinction, though, is that in supraventricular arrhythmias, there is no change in the normal QRS complex. Whereas in ventricular arrhythmias, the QRS complex widens. This is because in ventricular arrhythmias, the ventricular myocytes need to spread their uh, depolarization to other cells through their gap junctions, instead of relying on the really fast uh, system of conduction we mentioned here. This is kind of like a bullet train. Or relying on the gap junctions is kind of like you know a local bus, not to install local buses, but it's a lot slower. And because of that, you get a wider QRS complex because it takes longer in time to depolarize. So that's the important distinction that you can see in an EKG very clearly between a supraventricular tachycardia and a ventricular tachycardia. Now, supraventricular means above the ventricle. That could mean the atrial area or atrioventricular. So these are the two subcategories of location within supraventricular. Now here are listed a few examples that fall within each bucket. We have A-flutter and A-fib falling under atrial, as the name suggests. And we also have AVRT, which is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, and atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia under AV. And note that AVRT is often associated with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which we'll talk a little bit about later on in this discussion. Um, for ventricular arrhythmias, the major one we should think about is VTAC ventricular tachycardia. Now, VTAC has both monomorphic forms, where all the waves look the same and polymorphic forms, where all well, the waves can vary in how they look. Now, what's important to know is that VTAC, if not treated, can degenerate into V-fib. Uh, and V-fib, if not treated, can degenerate into a cardiac arrest, which, if not treated, would lead to death. So this is how you can categorize them by location. Broadly speaking, two categories, supraventricular and ventricular. Within supraventricular, there's atrial and AV. And the main way to differentiate between them on EKG is whether the P wave, the QRS complex, is a normal width or a wide width. So now that we discussed classifying arrhythmias based on their location, let's now talk about classifying arrhythmias based on their mechanism of generation. There are three major mechanisms by which arrhythmias generate. Abnormal automaticity, triggered activity, and re-entry. For abnormal automaticity, this is all about those intrinsic rates we were talking about earlier on that table. For whatever reason, the SA node is no longer the dominant uh, pacemaker. And that could be due to SA node damage, its rate getting lower, or it could be due to another pacemaker getting faster. Well, for whatever reason, if something else takes over in terms of having a higher automaticity rate, that will then become the dominant pacemaker. So in atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, the atrial myocytes are now the dominant pacemaker with a faster intrinsic rate than the SA node. In ventricular tachycardia, it's the same thing except the ventricular myocytes are now the major pacemaker in generating impulses and causing contractions. So that's what abnormal automaticity is about. It's all about those rates that we were talking about earlier. For triggered activity, towards the end of repolarization of a ventricular myocyte, it's very possible that there'll be what's called an after depolarization towards the end. If this depolarization is strong enough, it can lead to what's called a premature ventricular contraction. And those can uh, devolve into a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, triggered activity is associated with a specific ventricular tachycardia called torsade de point, which is French for um, twist of the points. And this is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that changes in amplitude in a very cyclic way. Tall amplitude to short to tall, back and forth. Now what's really, really important to know is that generally triggered activity arrhythmias are caused by a prolonged QT interval. On an EKG, QT interval is associated with uh, the, the time it takes for ventricular contraction. Now, there's a few things that can extend a QT interval, and QT intervals are extended by things that delay ventricular repolarization. These could be things like hypokalemia. It could be a congenital syndrome where you have ion channels that are messed up that lead to longer repolarization. 
It can also be, be drug-induced from drugs that block calcium channels, such as class 1A and class 3 antiarrhythmics. All of these things can prolong the QT interval, which can lead to potentially after depolarizations, which can eventually devolve into trisodic plant. So definitely associate prolonged QT, triggered activity, and trisodic plant in your mind. Lastly, let's talk about re-entry tachycardias. So there are a lot of videos that explain re-entry very well with really cool animations, and I don't have the ability to do that right now. So I'm just gonna try to, try to classify re-entry for you. In general, in order to have re-entry, you need to have a loop. And the idea is that the impulse travels around this loop very, very fast. Now, there's two ways this loop can emerge. Either there can be a physical anatomical loop with several pathways, or there can be a functional loop where there is tissue heterogeneity, meaning some tissue next to the other tissue is just faster at conducting for whatever reason, and you have a difference in conduction speed. For anatomical re-entry, the major thing we should think about is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, um, which in, in this syndrome, patients have an extra pathway called the bundle of Kent, which uh, connects their, their atrium to the ventricles and allows ventricular um, impulses to spread in another way, in addition to the normal conduction pathway we talked about earlier. So this provides an anatomical loop such that you can get an AVRT. That being said, not everyone with WBW will necessarily get an AVRT, but this provides you the extra pathway by which you can generate an AVRT. An AVRT, which stands for atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, just refers to this whole macroscopic loop reentry tachycardia. Now, you can also get a functional reentry tachycardia, which is when your loop is not actually several pathways, but it's more like tissue heterogeneity. And AVNRT stands for atrioventricular nodal re-entry tachycardia. This is where your functional loop is literally at the AV node itself. Um, and you can also get this uh, in ventricular myocytes, in which case it would lead to VTAC because you get the really fast loop happening in your ventricular myocytes. And as we mentioned earlier, VTAC can devolve into VFib and then the cardiac arrest. So now we're going to be talking about AV block. Now AV block is also known as heart block. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the role of the AV node is to slow down conduction from the SA node to the ventricles, such that the ventricles contract after the atria contract. However, if this slowdown of conduction is too slow, you get what is called AV block. Now, on an EKG, what measures this slowing down of conduction from the SA node to the ventricles is represented by the PR interval, and this will be extended in AV block, no matter what, what kind you have. So this is kind of a hallmark of of an AV block. So in first degree AV block, your PR interval is prolonged and is greater than 200 milliseconds. Now normally, your PR interval should be between 120 and 200 milliseconds. But in this case, it should be greater. And here we have an example of what that might look like. Obviously, we don't have units here, but this definitely looks like a prolonged PR interval. Note that the PR interval extends from the start of the P wave here to the start of the QRS complex here. So that's the PR interval, and here it's prolonged. However, Across wave to wave, the PR interval does not change. It stays prolonged, but it stays at a constant length from here to here. So that's the hallmark of a first degree AV block. Now in this case, even though conduction slowed through the AV node, it still will ultimately get transmitted to the ventricles, so there's no skip beats. Here we have second degree AV block. In second degree AV block, we have drop beats, but it's not every beat's dropped, it's certain beats. Now, second degree is further broken up into Mobitz type 1, also called Winkybach, which is a funny name, and uh, Mobitz type 2. In Mobitz type 1, we have progressive PR lengthening and then a drop beat. So let's take a look at this EKG here. We have this PR interval, we then have this PR interval, and this is longer than that, and then this is longer than that, and then, boom, a dropped QRS complex. So that's a dropped beat. The ventricle did not contract. Um, now, after this, it would reset, uh, similar to this, where you have a PR that's long, but not too long, and then a longer one, and then a longer one, and then repeat again. So it follows a very cyclic pattern. So if you see that cyclic pattern of prolonging PRs, then a drop beat, and then it starts all over again, that's Mobitz type 1, also called Winky Buck. Um, now, for Mobitz type 2, you have intermittent drop beats. So you'll ha uh, and the PRs are long, but they are, are constant. So unlike type 1, where the PR is prolonged, in a consistent fashion, here's a prolonged PR, prolonged PR, drop beat, same prolonged PR. Even though these look short, just 
we're pretending that these are long PRs. But the idea is that there's progressive lengthening here where there's no lengthening here. And finally, we have third degree heart block and complete heart block. So in first and second degree heart block, the AV node is slowing things down, but fundamentally, the impulse still gets conducted uh, to the ventricles and they contract. In third degree heart block, that impulse is not conducted. However, there aren't really what you would call drop beats. This is because since the AV is basically not conducting beats at all, the heart knows, or rather the ventricles know, that they're kind of blocked off from any SA conduction, and they kind of uh, send their own escape beats or escape rhythms. Now, what's important to know is that, going back to our chart over here, when the SA and AV nodes are blocked, th these guys down here have a lot slower uh, automaticity rate. So it's going to start firing at a very slow automaticity rate. That's why the interval RR between R waves is so long. Um, and also notice how the uh, PP intervals are consistent with each other, and the RR intervals are consistent with each other, but they're different from each other. This is because in third degree heart block, you have what's called AV dissociation. Basically, the atria are acting on their own, and the ventricles are acting on their own, right? The SA node is providing the electrical impulse for atrial contraction, where somewhere lower down the ventricular area is providing the electrical impulse for ventricular contraction. They're happening completely independently. This is called AV dissociation. And it's seen by consistent RR and PP intervals that are completely independent of each other. And that's important. So whereas in these, you get skip beats, you get drop beats. Here, you don't really have drop beats per se, but you have AV dissociation and completely uh, separated atrium and ventric ventricular contractions. Um, now, what's really important to note is that in first and second degree type 1, you tend to be asymptomatic. Whereas in second degree type 2 and third degree, you tend to have symptoms like dizziness and syncope. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, if you like this video, uh, please like and subscribe. And once again, a shout out to our amazing videographer and uh, scribe, uh, Peter Shea. Thanks and have a good day.